Hello, and welcome to Lecture 10 of Type Systems. In the previous lecture, we saw a proof system and uh, term syntax for classical logic, and we sketched out an operational semantics for it. And so in this lecture, we're going to continue the computational interpretation of classical logic, and we're going to connect it to an important implementation technique for functional languages called continuation passing style. So to recall the system of proof and refutation terms that we had in the last lecture, recall that we had the grammar of propositions corresponding to the propositions of classical propositional logic. So we have truth and conjunction, falsehood and disjunction, and negation. And then, in order to type check these propositions and their proofs and refutations, we had a judgment with a context of true hypotheses, things assumed to be true, and a context of false assumptions, or things assumed to be false. And so, to establish the truth of a term, we used values, which directly established that a proposition was true, and we also had continuations or refutations which directly established that a term is false. And together with the direct proofs and the direct refutations, we also had contradictions which said that you could prove something was true by assuming it was false and then showing a contradiction, and symmetrically we could show something was false by assuming it was true and establishing a contradiction. And a contradiction was nothing more than a proof that something was true paired with a proof that it was false. And so to recap the typing rules again, so in order to show that a term is true, so the way our true expressions worked was to say that uh, uh, we could use a variable to show that something is true. So if we had assumed that x showed a was uh, was a that x was a proof of a, then x is indeed a proof of a because we assumed it was so. And the unit was the proof of the true proposition. The if E was a proof of A and E prime was a proof of B, then you could pair together those two proofs to get a proof of A and B. And if we have a proof of A, we can uh, use the left injection to show that A or B is true. And if B is true, on the other hand, we can use the right injection to show that A or B is true. And finally, to show that not A is true, we can simply try refuting it and showing that A is false. And the nice thing about this classical system is that it's perfectly symmetrical. So our hypotheses say that we can show that A is false if we've assumed somewhere in the context that X is a, is a uh, assumption that A is false. The proposition false is always refutable. And if K is a refutation of A and K prime is a refutation of B, then we know we can pair these up to say that A or B is refutable, because regardless of whether you pick the right or the left branch, it's refutable. And on the other hand, in order to refute A and B, it, suff it suffices to refute A or it suffices to refute B. So either if we want to disprove A and B, it's enough to disprove either A or disprove B. And symmetrically, if we want to show that not A is false, well, if we have a proof that A is true, then we're in good shape. So we have this very symmetrical calculus of proofs and refutations, and we also have a nice little language of contradictions, where a contradiction is just a proof that A is both true and false, and we, sh we, we can show, we also have the ability to prove that something is true by means of using contradictions. So if we're able to assume that uh, A is false and get a contradiction, that's a proof that A is true. And symmetrically, if we assume that A is true and get a contradiction, that constitutes a refutation of A. Okay, so this is a beautiful, very symmetric calculus, and it even has a very, very nice operational semantics. So if you have a configuration, so if you have a contradiction, we can always simplify it. And so we're going back to this old idea from the 
uh, second or third lecture that evaluation is proof normalization. And in this case, for classical logic, evaluation is contradiction normalization. So if we have a proof that A and B is true by means of E1 comma E2, so E1 will be the proof of A and E2 will be the proof of B, and we're refuting it by saying A is refutable, we can simplify this and say, well, if A is refutable, then we can simplify this to E1 uh, contradicts K at the, at the type A. And similarly, if, our, if we're refuting the, uh, the second component of A and B, and we have a proof of A and a proof of B, then we don't actually need that proof of E1. It's enough to say that B is a contradiction um, between E2, which proves B, and K, which refutes B. And because of this nice symmetry, we can also flip things around for disjunction. So if we prove A or B with a left injunction, and we have a refutation of A or B with a refutation of A and a refutation of B, then we can simplify this, refu this refutation by saying, well, this refutation doesn't actually need the refutation of B. We don't actually use it. So we can simplify it to a proof of A and a refutation of A. And symmetrically, if our A or B is proved by a right injection so that E is a proof of B, then we can discard this refutation of A because we don't need it. So it can get simplified to um, B. Uh, we have a contradiction at type B with E as the proof of B and K2 as the refutation of B. And this one is one I really like, is if we have a contradiction at the type not A, and we have a proof of, of uh, not A, namely a refutation of A, and we have a refutation of not A, which is a proof of A, we can just swap these two things around. And so we can say, well, we have a contradiction at A using the proof E of A and the refutation K of A. And so these all like sort of trundle along very nicely. You can see that the type is getting smaller at every step. And the only sort of two interesting rules are the rules for contradiction. So if we have a proof of A by means of a contradiction uh, paired with a contradiction of A, then what we can do is we can say, well, what we're, going, we're going to, we have a contradiction of, uh, sorry, a refutation k, and so we can substitute it for this uh, refutation variable u, and we get a new contradiction uh, once we substitute k for u. And symmetrically, if we have a proof of a, and uh, the, we find a refutation by saying we're, we find a refutation by assuming that a is true, then we can simply substitute e for x to get the contra to get the simplified contradiction. And so this is a beautiful operational semantics for classical logic, and it's almost perfect. So the first thing we'll want to check is we'll want to check type safety. And so the preservation proof is incredibly easy. So the preservation proof is the thing that says that uh, typing will be maintained. And here what we'll say is that if C is a closed contradiction, and C simplifies to C prime, then C prime is still a contradiction. And so the neat thing about this proof is we don't need induction to do it. Because all of these reduction rules are sort of unconditional, we can just do a case analysis on them and the proof will work out just fine. So here's one of the example cases. So suppose that we'll just take that very first rule where we have um, a proof of A and B by saying we have E1, which is a proof of A, and E2, which is a proof of B, paired together with a refutation of A and B. And in this case, the way we refuted A and B is by using first of K. So K is the refutation of A, and so we're promoting that to a refutation of A and B. And our reduction rule says that that simplifies to a contradiction, E1 contradicts K at the type A. Okay, so that was our assumption of a reduction happening. And we also have a assumption that this thing is uh, well-typed. 
So what we're assuming is that um, since E1, E2 contradicts first of K, we're going to have E1, E2 as our proof of A and B, and we're going to have first of K as our refutation of A and B, and now we can case analyze these two derivations a little bit further. So if we look at the typing rule, typing of E1, E2 tells us A and B, we're going to have two subderivations. One that says E1 has the type A is a proof of A, and the other which says that E2 is a proof of B. And similarly, we can further analyze this derivation that first of K is a refutation of A and B. So what we can say, we can look at the typing rules and say that if we see that first of K is a refutation of A and B, that's only possible if K is a refutation of A. And so now look here, at 3, we have a proof that A, E1 is a proof that A holds, and down here at 4, we have K is a refutation of A, then we can apply the contradiction rule and say that E1 contradicts K at the type A. And so we've shown that type, preserva type preservation holds, and we didn't even need to appeal to induction at any step to do it. So it was a super easy case analysis, and each of the uh, uh, cases of this reduction relation, they're going to have an equally easy uh, 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 type preservation proof. So this, this part of type safety works perfectly. It's even better than in the simply typed lambda calculus. But you can probably guess that I said it was almost perfect. And the almost comes from the fact that if we're thinking of these closed terms as representing uh, our computation, then what does this mean? If C is a closed contradiction, then either C steps to C prime or C is final. Um, but hang on here. We wrote down this whole calculus as a sort of logic uh, for classical propositional logic, and we really hope that, cl that logic, classical logic is consistent. And if it's consistent, there won't be any contradictions. So this theorem is totally vacuous. So if classical logic is consistent, then this this uh, progress this progress theorem is vacuously true. There's no way to write a closed program, so progress will will hold for trivial reasons. Okay, well that's a little disappointing, and so you can think, okay, well maybe we can somehow extend this calculus in order to make it progress, and so. What we can do is we can maybe say, well, the problem we ran into was that we had no way of building any closed configurations, so any terminal configurations for this uh, contradiction judgment it just didn't work. And so one idea, which, which is uh, kind of a brutal idea, but it works surprisingly well, is that we can just say, well, if we need a type that that has a contradiction in it, maybe let's just add one. So we'll add a new type to classical logic, and we'll call it ants, or the type of answers, or final results, or something. And it's going to have a value halt, and it's going to have a continuation done. And the rules are going to be incredibly simple. We're going to say that halt is a proof of the answer type, and done is a refutation of the answer type. And so you can see here that neither of these ru uh, rules really depends on gamma or delta in any way. So they're perfectly well typed in the empty context. And furthermore, we simultaneously have a proof of ants and a refutation of ants. And so now, Progress is non-vacuous because we'll be able to prove by induction on the typing derivations that if we have a contradiction, then either it will take a step or it's going to be the terminal configuration. So where halt contradicts done at the type answer. And so this looks really slick and it works really slick too. So we now need a little bit of induction, so we can't completely in escape induction, but it's an easy induction on the typing derivations. 
Okay, so was that su uh, complete success? Well, no, not quite. So the addition of the answer type, which has both a, uh, a proof and a refutation, has disastrous consequences for the logical interpretation. So in particular, we'll be able to prove using uh, halt and ants that A and not A is true. So now we're, we're going to prove that the logical interpretation of classical logic has become degenerate. Okay, so how do we prove A and not A is true? Well, we have to prove A is true, on the, for, and we have to prove not A is true. Okay, so let's look at this. How can we prove A is true? Well, we can appeal to contradiction. And so what we can do is we can assume A, in order to prove that A is true, we're going to assume that A is false and try to show a contradiction. But it's always possible to show a contradiction. So we can show that... Uh, we can show a contradiction by saying, well, answer is true, and answer is false because of halt and done. And symmetrically, we can show that not A is true by saying, well, what we want to do is we want to refute A, and we can do that by contradiction too. So we'll assume A is true and try to show a contradiction, and we can do that because ants is, pro is provable and ants is refutable. So we didn't even need that assumption of A in, 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 for any purpose at all. So this was a totally degenerate term. So we're showing that A and not A is true by saying assume A is refutable and then get, get yourself a contradiction with halt and done. And we can refute we can show that not A is provable by constructing a refutation that says assume A is true and then immediately use the contradiction halt and done. So there's no interesting logical reading of this term at all. So our logic is now inconsistent and A because A and not A is derivable. So we were able to fix the operational behavior of this language but we weren't able to sort of save the logical reading. So we're sort of, uh, we're sort of caught on a Scylla and Charybdis thing here. So Scylla says, well, you have this beautiful set of proof terms and refutation terms, but you can't write any closed program. And Charybdis says, well, if you add a, uh, a terminal configuration that is well-typed in the empty context, you can write all the programs that you want, but, um, Unfortunately, the logical reading collapses. So is there any way to reconcile this? And, well, let's go back and look at intuitionistic logic. So intuitionistic logic has a clean computational reading, and classical logic almost has a clean computational reading. So the preservation theorem was beautiful, like even better than in intuitionistic logic, but the progress theorem didn't work. And so what you can do is you can say, well, normally we think of uh, intuitionistic logic as a restriction of classical logic, but do we have to? Maybe we can go the other way around. Maybe what we can do is we can embed classical logic into uh, intuitionistic logic and thereby acquire a computational reading by inheritance. So if we were somehow able to squeeze every bit of classical logic right into intuitionistic logic, then sort of by translation we would get a computational reading for classical logic. And so that's what we're going to pursue in the rest of the lecture. And so the idea that we're going to pursue, and we're going to pursue it in several different guises, is called the double negation translation. So what we're going to do is we're going to define uh, this translation by first picking some intuitionistic proposition P. It doesn't really matter which one, and we're just going to choose it to be a parameter. It could be false, it could be integers, it could be any proposition you like. And so once we've fixed this proposition P, we're going to define the quasi-negation, which I'll say not X, except I'll write it with a little wavy line to indicate that it's not a true negation, it's just quasi-negation. And so what it's going to be is just as 
real negation is x arrow, x implies false. Here we're going to say quasi negation is x implies p. And now we can define a translation on the grammar of classical ty types as follows. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say to translate not a, we will take the quasi negation of the translation of a. To translate the true, we'll choose unit. To translate a and b, we'll translate a and pair it with the translation of b. And here's where things get really, really slick. To translate false, we'll use our chosen proposition p. And to translate a or b, what we're going to do is we're going to not not the translation of a plus the translation of b. So what's so all these things inside this translation are classical types, and the things that result are intuitionistic types. And I'm writing them with the computational uh, plus and times notation, the simply typed lambda calculus notation, just in order to keep the uh, the grammar is more distinct, so you can see what's been translated and what hasn't been translated a bit more easily. And so the the thing that's going on here is we are in a just a couple of places we're treating falsehood by means of this chosen proposition and we're treating disjunction by means of a double negation and the reason that we did this is because the the essence of classical logic is the ability to do double negation elimination. So if you can show that not not x implies x, then you're in the classical world. And in general, it's not derivable in, in, in intuitionistic or constructive logic. But there is some weaker property that is derivable. So we can show that if you have not 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 x, that implies not x. So this is sometimes called triple negation elimination. So double negation elimination is not doable in intuitionistic logic, that's impossible. But triple negation elimination is possible, and it's even possible for any quasi-negation. And so the way that we can do this is we can so show that not 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 x implies not x. And the term for this is a little bit of a mouthful, lambda k, lambda a, k applied to lambda q, q applied to a. And so this kind of term is not really comprehensible unless you write down the typing derivation. So let's do that. So k is going to be triple negated x. And so having assumed that k has this type, we check the body of the lambda. Lambda x has the type k, lambda q, q a. Well, okay, and we want to see that the whole thing has the type not x. Okay, so to do that, we're going to recall that not x is really x arrow p. And so we'll assume that x has the type x, and uh, this, this little mouthful of an expression has the type uh, p. And so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, k has the type not 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 x. And so that means we have to check that the uh, argument to k has to have the type not not x. And so lambda q q x has to have the type not not x. Okay, well, let's keep unrolling the definition of quasi-negation. That's now x arrow p arrow p. And so that means that q has the type not x, or in other words, x arrow p, and x has the type x. So if you pass x to q, then q, q applied to x will have the type p. And so now this whole thing will tell us that not 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 x has implies not x. And so this isn't quite what we wanted for double negation elimination, but it's going to be an important ingredient in getting it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that our translation on classical types does have the double negation property. So we're going to be able to show that for each type, classical type A, there is a term double negation elimination of A such that not not of A translation implies A translation. Okay, and so once we have this term, we'll be able to use it in our embedding of classical logic into 
intuitionistic logic. So we'll mimic the structure of the intuitionistic argument as much as possible, and then whenever you use a genuinely classical bit of reasoning, we'll have the double negation term available in order to do the translation. So let's look at how this works. And so it's really helpful here to look at each of the uh, each of the uh, translations for the types. I don't have room to fit it on the slides, but you should all have uh, have the slides available, maybe in another browser tab, maybe on a piece of paper, you should be able to look at it and see the translation type. And so we translate true to, to unit, and so this type DNE of unit has the type not not one has to give us the unit type one. And that's easy because we just ignore the argument and take unit. Um, the, tr the trickier one is conjunction. So here what we've got is not not of translation of A paired with the translation of B. And so we and we want to produce a pair of A translation B translation. And to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, appeal to induction. We'll, we'll use double negation on the smaller types A and B. Double, double negation elimination on the smaller types A and B. And so if we do that, what we need to do is we need to show that not not of the uh, translation of A paired with the translation of B lets us compute not not of the translation of A. Okay, and so what we've got here is K will have the type not of A translation. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, Q is something that takes um, not of A and B. So we'll say, okay, we'll give it that not A and B by saying, okay, we'll pass it a function. And this argument P will have the type translation of A times the translation of B. And we'll say, okay, K only needs something of the type translation of A. And since we have that pair, we can just use its first component and pass it to it. And so now this whole expression, lambda K, Q applied uh, to lambda P dot K first of P, this will have the type not not translation of A. And then we use double negation elimination to turn it into a translation of A. And the same thing goes for B. Okay, so that was actually the hardest case of this translation. Um, for bottom, it's actually very easy. So we want to produce something of this type P and not not of, of the bottom type is P arrow P arrow P and so we can just take this Q and give it the identity function because that will have the type P R O P. So again, it's really important to try and write typing derivations for each of these things. And I strongly urge you to just take out a sheet of paper, take these terms and draw the typing derivations for them. So if you just look at them, they'll look incredibly mysterious. Um, but once you draw the typing derivation, you'll see that there's really no choice at all in how to get the how to cook up these terms. You just write down the type you want, and you apply the typing rules one by one, and then you end up with these terms. So for A or B, the translation of this one is the place where we stuck in the extra double negation. So the translation of uh, a or B is not not translation of A plus the translation of B. And when we stick yet another not not in front of it, we get not 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 uh, translation of A plus the translation of B. And so the thing to notice is that if you've got four knots in sitting in front of you, that's also three knots. So we can use double negation, tr sorry, triple negation elimination to turn three of these knots into one knot. And so that will turn not 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 into just not not. And so we apply triple negation elimination to Q and we get exactly what we wanted to. And the same thing happens with the uh, with uh, negation. So we have not not of not A, and that's triple negation, so we can immediately apply triple negation elimination to get back to the uh, 
not a translation that we wanted. Okay, so we've we've cooked up a double negation elimination term that works at any type for of the classical propositional logic. How can we use this to invent a translation from our classical proof term calculus um, to the intuitionistic proof term calculus? Well, to understand this, it's actually helpful to see how these uh, how these terms work. And so this is like one of the simplest cases I, that I told you to do uh, on your own. So the case for, for false says we want to take not not false translated to false translated. And so remember that false the translation of false is that fixed proposition P. So we want to translate uh, not not P to P. And so how do we do that? Well, if you unfold these knots, each little uh, pseudo, pseudo negation is just something arrow P. So this Q will have the type P arrow P arrow P. And so now we can just follow our nose with the typing derivation. We stick Q in the context and we want to do an application of it to an argument. And so that means that we have to ch we have to check that Q has a function type, which it visibly does, and its argument lambda x dot x has the type uh, p arrow p. Okay, and the way we do that is we assume that x has the type p, and then we check that x has the type p, which it does. And so now we're able to draw this typing derivation, and you can see that sort of our moves were forced at each step. There was only really one thing we could do. Okay, and so we have this double negation elimination. How do we use it in order to uh, actually embed classical terms into intuitionistic terms. And so the, what we're going to do is we're just going to cook up a translation. So we're going to adopt the powerful proof technique of wishful thinking. We're going to write down the theorem that we want and see if we're able to find it. So we have our translation, a circle, on types. How do we get a translation for the proof terms? Well, we have three judgments for classical logic. So we'll want to translate them into, we'll want th sort of three theorems saying how they tr embed into intuitionistic logic. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, if E is a proof of A, then if we translate the true context and we translate the false context, then the translation of E will have the type translation of A. And next we'll say, well, if we have a refutation of A, we want to translate it into not of the translation of A. And we'll say that if C is a contradiction, we want to translate it to a proof of P, that fixed proposition. And in all three of these cases, we're going to translate the, the context in some systematic fan, fashion. So let's do that. So how can we translate value context? Well, the obvious thing to do is to say, well, we want to translate variables to variables. So if classically we have a, a proof variable of type A, we'll just send it to an intuitionistic variable of translation of A. And if we have a, a refutation hypothesis of, uh, of A, what we're going to do is we're going to send it to the translation of A negated. So every true hypothesis will be sent to its translation and every refutation variable will be sent to the negation of its translation. Okay, so that's a sensible thing to do, but can we actually give a translation on terms? And the way that we'll do this is by the strategy of wishful thinking. We'll look at each typing derivation rule and say, assuming that we were able to translate the uh, the premise is, are we able to invent a translation for the, uh, for the conclusion? And what we can do here is we can say, aha, let's look at the contradiction case. So we want to find a proof, uh, a translation that has the type P. And if we look at, 
by in, uh, by our sort of inductive assumption, we're going to say E has the type A translated. And if we translate K, we'll have a function A translated to P, or pseudo negation of A. And so if we have both of those, it's actually really easy to produce something of type P. We say, well, take the translation of K and give it the translation of E as an argument. So K has the type A translated to P, and E has the type A translated, so it's easy to construct the proof of P that we're taking to be our contradiction. Okay, so that was surprisingly easy. Let's look at some of these other terms, like maybe some expressions. So what we'll do is we'll say, we'll translate variables to variables, because we're assuming that X has some type A translated, some type A, and so when we translate it, it'll have the type A translated, which is just what we want. And similarly, units will get translated to units. A pair will get, trans get translated to uh, a pair of translations, a left injection will get translated to something a bit more interesting. So remember that we stuck an extra not not in front of the translation for or. And the reason we did this was because the de Morgan rules hold for uh, or and and in classical logic, and we wanted to make that all work out. But when we give proof terms in intuitionistic logic, we have to do this little dance. So we want the translation to have the type not not a plus b or translation of A plus translation of B. And so we assume that we get an argument, K, of the type not A plus B, and then to this continuation we'll give L, uh, we'll give the translation of E tagged with L. So that will have the type, um, E will have the type translation of A, left of E will have the type uh, translation of A plus translation of B, and then when we pass it to K we'll get the, the the expression of type P that we need symmetrically for the right embedding. And for negation, well, we said that the proof of a negation is the refutation of that proposition. And so we can just say, well, if we want to translate not K, we'll just send it to K because that's going to have that's going to have the type translation of A arrow P that we wanted or quasi negation of the translation of A. And we can do something symmetric for the continuations. So if we have an assumption that x is a refutation variable, then since we're going to negate all of the refutation variables, we can simply use it on the right-hand side of a refutation. So this is going to have the type um, a lolly arrow p, and uh, sorry, a translated arrow p, and this will also have the type a, tra a translated arrow p, and so the quasi-negations will line up. So do draw the typing derivations for all of these rules, you'll see that they work perfectly. Um, if you have a refutation of false, well that's very easy. Um, we want to have the type p arrow p, because the translation of false is p, and we want to produce a refutation of that, so we want something of type p arrow p, and the identity function satisfies. And if you want to translate the pair of refutations k1, k2, then what we'll do is we'll say we want to um, we want to uh, refute a the translation of a plus the translation of b. So we assume that we get something in the image of the translation. So it's going to be not not a translated plus b translated. And to this, we're going to say give k a function which takes an a plus b and if the tagged value is left pass it the continuation k1 and if the tagged value is eventually right pass it the continuation k2 so again on your own draw these typing derivations it will really clarify what's going on here and for the translation of the refutation of A and B, this says, well, if you give me a pair, then I, I can simply use the first component and pass it to this refutation of K. And same for the second component. Okay, so that's really nice. And so the thing to notice here is that this first and second are the tags in the classical calculus, and this first and second are the projections in the intuitionistic lambda calculus. And the way that not works 
is we say, well, if you give us a, 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 a we want a refutation of A, and so um, we want to refute that, so we assume we have not A, and we want to find a refutation. Well, E is going to be something of A translated, so we can just pass E to K, and we get that term of type P that we wanted. Um, translating refutations, now what we can do is we can uh, translate reasoning by, contra by contradiction. So let's look at translating the way we do refutations by contradiction. So we 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 show that A is refutable by assuming that we have an A and then looking for a contradiction. And so if we assume that the translation works on the premise, then what we know is that if you translate gamma x colon A and you negate and you translate not get delta, then C translation uh, will have the type P because C is a contradiction and our Sonnes theorem said that the translation of contradictions should have the type P. Okay, so that part was easy. And so by the definition of this uh, context translation, we have gamma circle x colon A translated um, paired with uh, not delta, and, and we know that uh, C circle will have the type P just by the, by the assumption that this translation works on smaller terms. So if we've got that, then by the lambda introduction rule, we know that lambda x dot C translated has the type A translated arrow P, and that's a quasi-negation. Ah, and that's actually the type we wanted for A false. Okay, and so we can simply define the translation of this refutation by contradiction as just a function in the intuitionistic in intuitionistic logic. And a similar argument works for proof by contradiction. So with proof by contradiction, what we do is we assume that A is false, find a contradiction, and then conclude that because we found a contradiction, A is actually true. And so initially, this reasoning will work very similar, similarly to the previous slide. So we assume the translation works on the premise. So now we know that C translated has the type P, and we've, uh, we assume that the translation of delta U colon A goes according to plan. And that means that we have the translation of gamma, the, trans the negation of delta, and we have an assumption U that not a translated holds. And so then, by function introduction, we know that uh, under gamma translated and delta translated, lambda u dot c translated has the type not a translated to p. And uh, that's exactly the same as not not a translated. And now what we can do is we can say, well, two slides back, we showed that double negation elimination is sound for types in the image of the translation. And so therefore, we have something of the type of the... We have something of the uh, translation of A type. And so we can set the translation of, of reasoning by contradiction to the double negation elimination of lambda u dot c translated. And so this thing has given us a way of taking every single classical proof and turning it, it, turning it into a corresponding intuitionistic proof. And so even though normally we think of intuitionistic logic as a sublogic of classical logic, we see here that it's actually the other way around as well. So classical logic is a subsystem in intuitionistic logic. So, so the embeddings go in both directions. And now, because intuitionistic logic is consistent, we sort of get a free consistency proof for uh, classical logic. And because classical log intu cl intuitionistic logic has a good operational semantics, classical logic can get one too. So you can say the operational semantics of this classical term are whatever this the embedding into intuitionistic logic that's that's the operational semantics of this classical of this classical term. We can just piggyback on the um, operational semantics of intuitionistic logic. So that's pretty neat.
Um, and it's this is a neat idea, and it's an idea that's been been invented many, many times. So just among logicians, Gerhard Gensen and Kurt Gödel came up with it um, independently, but they came up with the same translation. The Russian mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov came up with it. Came up with it. So did Valery Glavenko, and so did the Japanese logician Sugikatu Kuroda. And so the, what, they, what they did in every single case was find some translation that let them show that double negation elimination was valid for the formulas in the image of their translation. So if you were able to do that, then you were pretty much always able to successfully translate classical terms to intuitionistic ones. So the Gödel Gensen translation was a was very similar to the one that we just saw, except that it used a slightly different translation on types. So uh, the translation of negation and truth and conjunction and falsehood was the same, but we just use a different De Morgan duality, the disjunction type. So instead of using the plus at all, we just say we're going to translate A or B as not of not A and not B. So we're using negation and conjunction in order to encode disjunction. So that's a fine translation. There's an even simpler translation that would that's due to Andrei Kolmogorov. And what Andrei Kolmogorov noticed was that, well, there is a super simple way of embedding classical logic into intuitionistic logic. And he said, well, if you just stick not not in the front of everything, you've got a perfectly good embedding. So the way you translate not a is by saying not not of not a translated. The way that you translate A implies B is by saying not not of A, A translated implies B translated. And the same for every single one of these connectives. So in every case, all we do is we stick not not in front of the original connective and then recursively apply that uh, translation. Um, and this is a translation that has some really nice properties. So with our earlier translation, we were able to prove that double negation elimination was derivable, but we had to do some type-based argument where we said we'll do induction on types. With the Kolmogorov translation, double negation elimination is super easy. And the reason is that the triple negation elimination term we defined, it will always work. So if you have not not of a translated, well, this a translation is going to stick an additional pair of not nots in front of anything. And so then you can use triple negation elimination to collapse four not nots, four nots into two nots, and then we're back to where we started. So double negation elimination works in like a completely uniform way for the Kolmogorov translation. And this is one of the things that makes its uh, useful for uh, um, for things like compilers. So in uh, in one B compilers, you'll st you'll see a lot of continuations, and they all have this uh, hinted at connection to logic. Okay, and so so that so this gives us a. A, in fact, I shouldn't say A, like a whole family of embeddings from classical logic into intuitionistic logic. But there's a problem. And the problem is that we came up with a proof term calculus for classical logic, so our proof and refutation calculus, but it's a really ugly, awkward calculus to program in. So the only way we get any binding forms is by using contradiction and because contradictions always pair a proof and a refutation, this makes it very difficult to write nested computations. And if you think about a, cont a continuation as a sort of stack, then this is a language which makes all stack use totally explicit. Yeah, so functional languages make the stack implicit. So you never have to write the stack explicitly. And our classical term calculus made the stack explicit, which made it really awkward to program in. And so one question you can ask is, is there any way to give a calculus for classical programming that's as comfortable to program in as the intuitionistic calculus? And the answer to this question is yes. And 
the way we can do this is by adding first class continuations to the typed lambda calculus. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the simply typed lambda calculus with units, products, and disjunctions, and implications, and then we're going to add one more type former. We're going to add first class negations. We're not going to encode it as x0, zero, zero. we're just going to add not x as a first class primitive. The rest of the lambda calculus will look just the same as it always has, but we're going to add two new features, which we're going to call throw and let cont. And the way that this will work is that all of the typing rules will look exactly the same as in the intuitionistic case. So there's no two contexts, there's only one context, and the context only contains uh, very, uh, true hypotheses. And so all the typing rules for units and pairs will look just the same as before. The typing rules for functions and variables will look just the same as before. We, we find that x has the type x by looking in the context. We form implications with lambda abstraction. We use implications with function application. Sums in the empty type use the same case statements and tagging that we've seen. And the only thing that will be any different at all is the typing for continuations. And so here is where we can squeeze all of classical logic into this calculus. And so what we can do is we can say we have this construction let cont, which says that if we're trying to use a, a prove x, we are allowed to assume not x and show x. And so what, the way you can think about this is this is a sort of encoding proof by contradiction. So we want to prove x, and so we assume not x holds, and then if we're if ever able to find a contradiction, we'll immediately be able to prove x. And so that's how we're going to use the cont rule. And so, so that shows up in the typing for throw. So what we're doing is we're saying, if we, if we have a proof of not x and we have a proof of x, that's a contradiction. And from contradiction, anything follows. So we can give it an arbitrary type y. And so let cont says, I'm trying to prove x, so I'll assume not x. And if I'm ever able to derive a contradiction, I'll immediately be able to get the x that I wanted. And this makes writing all kinds of, uh, of proof terms much easier because any kind of ordinary intuitionistic reasoning works just the same, but all the principles of classical reasoning are now expressible in this intuitionistic looking context, uh, uh, language. So here's double negation elimination. Not not x implies not x. And so since this is an implication, we write it as a lambda abstraction. So we assume we get a k that has the type not not x. And then what we'll do is we will say um, we will assume that we have, we'll use let cont because we're trying to show x and that will give us a variable of the type not x. And so we have a not x and we have a not not x and so we can throw this u of type not x to this k of type not not x. Similarly, we can give a term that has the type x or not x. And so the way that we'll do this is, because we're trying to prove x or not x, we'll use let cont and say, okay, now we have not, we're going to assume that not x or not x holds. And so to u, what we're going to do is we're going to throw a value of type x or not x. And how do we do that? Well, we'll do this in a slightly tricky way. What we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we have to, in order to throw something to u, we either have to have an x or a not x. And so let's pick not x. So we'll right tag it. And that says we're going to get a not x. And so now we want uh, to produce a term of type not x. And since we're trying to produce a term of not x, we use let cont to get a not not x. And now we can say, okay, I'll throw to you 
the left embedding of double negation elimination of Q. And so this is a bit of a tricky term. What it's doing is it's saying we prove X or not X by claiming that we can prove the right branch. And then if that ever leads to a contradiction, we'll use that contradiction to say, well, actually, I meant, I meant the left branch, in fact. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a tricky kind of argument, but X or not X is still uh, directly exp expressible in this calculus. And in order to show how to implement or interpret this calculus, you can either give a, uh, a, di a, uh, a direct operational semantics to it, or you can use these translations that we've spent the whole lecture looking at. So let's use the Kolmogorov translation. So we're going to say, we're going to translate not x as not not of not x translated. Um, and so we're going to apply a uniform double negation of everything, and then we're going to use the same connective we expected, and then uh, but applied to the translated types. And so what we'll do for all of the contexts is we'll say, okay, uniformly apply the translation to all of the variables. And then what we're going to do is we're going to prove the CPS translation theorem, which says that if E has the type X, then the translation of E has the type translation of X. And so for this extended lambda calculus with let content throw, we're going to show that we can take this extent, these extended terms and embed them into the unextended lambda calculus. And so we're going to show that sort of by translation, um, this classical calculus with continuations is expressible in the intuitionistic calculus that doesn't have it. And we're going to use the same trick of the Kolmogorov translation and the quasi-negations. And the way to actually derive this translation is to try to prove this theorem by induction on the typing derivation. Um, I don't have room to put all of those on the slide, but I'll show you what it looks like. So here, what we'll say is that X has some type originally had some type A, the translation will give it some type not not of something. And so we assume we have some X, some K, which is not A translated. And so to X, which has the type not not A translated, we can pass the K and we get the, uh, we get the uh, P that we wanted. Unit gets translated as give me a continuation and I'll pass it a unit. Uh, pairs get translated as I have a continuation that wants an A and a uh, A pair, A translated paired with a B translated. So translate E1 and give it a continuation that takes an X, something of type A. Then in the body, trans take the translation of E2 and give it a continuation that that gets a, a Y of type B, and then to that original continuation K, pass the pair X comma Y. Um, and so that you'll be able to show that this respects the translation theorem that we, that we, uh, that we sketched out above. And so first and second of E are also expressible. So we say K is a continuation that takes an A, so it's going to be A translated arrow P. Um, and now if you translate E, we're going to, it's going to be not, not of, uh, A times A translated times B translated. So if we pass it a continuation, this P will have the type A translated times P B translated. And so we can just pass the first component to K and conversely the second component. And as usual for everything in this lecture, take these terms and dry, draw typing derivations for them and they will suddenly become massively less mysterious. Left embeddings work the way we expect. Um, you, we have an, uh, a, uh, a uh, uh, not not in the front of a, a translated plus B translated. So now we say translate E and give it a continuation to get that X of type A and then to the continuation K pass left of, left of X. 
to get the A plus B that we A translated plus B translated that we wanted. Symmetrically for right and case works in a very similarly a similar way, we have E, which has the translation of A plus B. Um, and now we will pass it a, a continuation, which will take a, a, a tagged value. We case analyze that and we pass this continuation K um, either to a E1, translation of E1, or the translation of E2. So do draw the typing derivations. Um, but everything works in like a very systematic fashion. And once you try to draw the typing derivations, you'll see that you have very few free choices in these CPS translations. Um, the only place where anything sort of tricky happens is in the tra CPS translation for continuations. Um, and so what you'll see for throw is E1 will has the type um, not, not X, it'll get translated to quasi not, quasi not, quasi not of the translation of X, that'll be the type of E1, and E2 will have the type, uh, will have the type translation of A. And so if we triple negate, triple negation elimination on that E1, we can directly pass it E2 and we'll get the P that we want. And you should notice something interesting here. The K was used in every single other case, but here we just ignore it. And that sort of corresponds to the fact that a throw can have an arbitrary type. And the reason it can have an arbitrary type is we give it a continuation that handles something of that arbitrary type Y, and then we just don't use it. And similarly for let cont, we're going to sit, stick not x in the context, and so when we translate it, it'll have the type quasi not quasi not quasi not of the translation of x. And so if you get a k which has the type uh, um, uh, not of x, because this whole thing will have the type uh, uh, not not of something, you can construct that triply negated thing by saying, okay, lambda q, q applied to k, and then we substitute it for u in the translation of e. And so again, draw the typing derivations, and in particular, the typing derivation for this function right here, and you'll see that everything works out sort of the way that you expect, or in a type correct fashion. And so now what we've done is we've taken every single uh, term in the language with first class continuations and we've embedded it into the simply typed lambda calculus by means of this continuation passing style translation. And so this inheritance strategy continues to work as a way of giving the computational calculus uh, the cal classical calculus, a computational reading. And one important point to keep in mind is because we have so many choices for the embedding of classical logic into intuitionistic logic, there's a lot of possible CPS translations. There isn't just one choice, there's lots of them, and I happen to pick just one of them. Um, one, for this lecture. And each of the other ones that we saw in the lecture also give rise to a different way of doing this embedding. So thank you very much for your time. Bye.